Hi, everyone. Welcome again to another um, uh, data seminar. I'm very pleased uh, today to have uh, Jay Deep to talk on his, uh, uh, to give a talk on his latest work. Um, uh, Jay Deep Patak is a uh, NISAP for Learning postdoctoral fellow at NERSC. Uh, I think many of you are familiar uh, with uh, NISAP and familiar also with Jay Deep. Um, he has been working on incorporating machine learning techniques for problems in computational fluid dynamics. Uh, he joined NERSC uh, after receiving his PhD from the University of Maryland uh, in 2019, just at the end of last year. His primary interests are in developing machine learning techniques for improving simulations in diverse fields, such as weather forecasting and climate modeling, fluid turbulence and combustion. Very excited to have him talk about this very exciting topic, actually. Uh, so uh, please enjoy. Jadeep. Thanks, Thank Mustafa. Thanks for that introduction. Um, so um, yeah, I'm Shadeep. Uh, I'm a NISA uh, for learning postdoc, uh, working on computational fluid dynamics and machine learning. Uh, and today I'll be talking about using machine learning to augment uh, course grid computational fluid dynamics simulations. Um, uh, this work was done uh, with my collaborators, Mustafa, Karthik, uh, Emmanuel, Thorsten, and Mark. So um, let's begin. Um, let me first introduce the uh, problem and why it's important. So um, simulation of turbulent flows at high Reynolds numbers is a computationally challenging task. Uh, it's relevant to a large number of engineering and scientific applications um, in a lot of fields such as climate science, aerodynamics, and combustion. Uh, you would typically um, model uh, turbulent flows uh, using the Navier-Stokes equations and um, um, try to numerically simulate the neighbor's Stokes equations. Um, direct numerical simulation or DNS of the neighbor's Stokes equations with uh, sufficient uh, numerical resolution to capture all the relevant scales of turbulent motions uh, can incur a prohibitive amount of computational expense. Um, and if you um, simulate a fluid flows at a lower resolution than is uh, warranted by the problem, uh, on, that is on a course grid, then that introduces significant errors due to under-resolving important small-scale physics. Uh, so a, a simulation approach that can improve the accuracy of CFD simulations while uh, keeping the computational burden low uh, could have a broad impact on fields such as weather forecasting, um, assessing uh, renewable energy resources uh, and precipitation, as well as for aerodynamics and combustion applications. So it's an interesting and um, important um, discipline. So um, to tackle the problem of simulating uh, turbulent flows with sufficient resolution, there are a lot of powerful tools. Uh, one of them is adaptive mesh refinement, uh, which uses localized coarse and fine grids depending on the local resolution requirements. Um, and the ultimate goal of our project is to incorporate machine learning techniques within AMR codes to further reduce uh, computational requirements of uh, computational fluid dynamics simulations. Uh, but before we can work with a fully full-fledged three-dimensional uh, turbulent AMR code, uh, we develop and present a novel machine learning technique on a simpler two-dimensional problem uh, without any AMR techniques. And our proof of concept prototype architecture um, we believe has the potential to be generalized to a wide variety of domains and complexity. Um, our approach is a hybrid approach. So we combine machine learning uh, with a partial differential equation solver. Um, and the reason for that is that the computational cost of training pure machine learning based uh, CFD solvers uh, remains prohibitively high uh, for all but the simplest of problems. And for example, uh, there have been a number of impressive advances in the development of data-driven models of the Earth's atmosphere, uh, which is a very important problem for like weather forecasting, um, climate simulation. Uh, but these uh, uh, purely data-driven or purely machine learning based uh, models of the Earth's atmosphere um, are considerably more expensive to run than um, comparable um, state-of-the-art physics-based uh, general circulation models. And um, so yeah, then there is uh, definitely a need for a hybrid approach. Uh, you're al also going to have data availability and computational resource constraints, uh, which warrant um, the development of such a hybrid approach uh, where a physics-based numerical solver uh, would work 
in tandem with a couple machine learning architecture. And this approach leverages the strength of uh, each of the two um, techniques and uh, while sim simultaneously maintaining a reasonable computational and data cost. So um, let's look at some uh, simple uh, ways to contextualize the computational cost estimates of uh, turbulence simulations. Uh, the computational cost of a simulation for a given problem uh, is directly related to the resolution requirements. Uh, now this will depend, the specifics of this will depend on the type of uh, solver used, um, but um, there are some interesting generalizations that we can make which allow us to make a simple um, estimates. So the resolution requirements are determined uh, on one side by the Kolmogorov of length scale and on the other side by the size of the system under study. So uh, as this cartoon tries to illustrate here, uh, let's say you're trying to simulate some um, fluid flow, your uh, computational grid has to be large enough to cover the entire domain, which tells you what the size of the computational grid should be. And it should, it also needs to be fine enough um, um, to be able to resolve the smallest scale um, spatial features. So uh, for example, a, a flow will have um, a range of spatial features from the largest um, eddies to intermediate uh, sized eddies and up to the smallest scale features which will uh, uh, dissipate. So your grid has to be fine enough to capture these smallest small scale features. Um, and uh, this lets us um, perform some back of the envelope simplified estimates of the computational cost of a simulation and as it relates to the resolution. Um, so it's a reasonable assumption um, to say that the computational cost for a single um, partial differential equation time step scales roughly as the number of grid cells. So if you increase the number of grid cells, then the computational cost um, increases linearly. Um, and due to the um, CFL condition, which states that within a single PD time step, the flow uh, cannot uh, cover uh, more than a fraction of a grid cell, um, this sets an, uh, a bound on the largest possible time step that a PD solver can take. And um, this, um, largest time a possible time step um, roughly scales linearly as the size of a basic grid cell. Again, these are very uh, simplified assumptions, but um, they um, give us some pretty good rough estimates. And if you put these two constraints together, uh, you can obtain a rough scaling estimate. So if you double the resolution in uh, both uh, all, all the spatial directions, uh, then uh, that increases the overall cost of a simulation by a factor of two to the power d plus one, where d is the dimension of your system, which is going to be either two or three, uh, depending on whether you are, you're working with a two-dimensional flow or three-dimensional flow. And just to put some numbers down, um, for example, if you're running a 3D simulation on a grid that's coarser by a factor of four, then the computational cost will be reduced by a factor of four to the power three plus one, uh, which is 256, which is a um, pretty large speed up um, or a pretty large uh, reduction in computational cost. Um, so let's see uh, if we can um, use that to our advantage. So what we have discussed so far tells us that the, the one way to accelerate a simulation might be to uh, run it on a coarse grid, which does not resolve the fluids fully, uh, the fields fully down to the Kolmogorov scale. However, um, this results in an imprecise or incomplete solution. And uh, we want to explore this idea in, our, uh, in, in this talk uh, and in our, in our work that uh, can we use uh, machine learning to correct and under-resolve simulation. Now, uh, there are some very interesting parallels um, with image, image processing, and there have been some pretty remarkable recent developments in the field of single image super resolution. Um, and to try to demonstrate what single image super resolution is, I'm borrowing this image from this review paper on um, deep learning for single image super resolution. So um, uh, the main, the key idea is that if you have a high resolution image and you blur and downsample it and add noise to it, uh, uh, which results in a loss of information, uh, you get up, obtain a low resolution image. And so um, this pathway is um, lossy. You uh, lose information in the blurring and the noise addition. Um, the uh, goal of uh, SISR is to try and recover the high resolution image from its low resolution counterpart. Uh, now, clearly this is uh, an ill-defined problem. So um, what, 
how you add the information or how you create new information where uh, you have lost information is going to depend on what your uh, goal is like what uh, what you want the want from the high resolution recovered image um, but there's been some pretty um, uh, remarkable recent work um, that uses deep learning um, for SISR and uh, it has shown some pretty impressive results in the field of image processing. Uh, for example, this paper, which uses generative adversarial networks for uh, uh, photorealistic single image super resolution. Um, and as the, uh, these figures show, it does a really a remarkable job of um, uh, uh, super resolving a blurry image. Um, <coughs> So um, the question we uh, try to address is, can we use, use image super resolution techniques uh, based on deep learning for super resolving turbulent fields? And at this point, it's very important to note some differences between turbulence and image processing. Uh, it's not uh, sufficient to simply super resolve a low resolution trajectory with machine learning. Uh, and that's because the low resolution simulation and the high res simulation have uh, different physics. And this is due to nonlinear interactions across length scales, uh, which um, results in the dynamics at small scales uh, affecting the dynamics at large scales and uh, vice versa. So it's not uh, sufficient to simply um, create a set of uh, images using a low resolution simulation of, uh, of a fluid field and apply your favorite uh, deep learning architecture um, and try to um, obtain high resolution fields. Uh, because there's a fundamental difference in the uh, physics of the high-res simulation and the low-res simulation. Um, to sort of illustrate this, uh, here, here's a, a simple cartoon. So um, the trajectory of a low-res CFD simulation, denoted in small x of t, is not going to be a, a simply be a downsampled version of the high-resolution trajectory denoted by capital X of t. Uh, even if you start uh, the, both the trajectories with similar initial conditions, that is, one is an interpolation of the other, um, they, um, due to the different physics in the simulation um, and the nonlinear interactions across uh, length scales, um, they are going to diverge here. You have uh, completely different uh, trajectories uh, starting from similar initial conditions. So uh, with this uh, background, I, I will describe our hybrid architecture that combines uh, deep learning uh, with a PDA solver. So let's try. Let's start um, to build this hybrid architecture. Um, let's uh, suppose you have a set of fields, uh, capital X of T, uh, with resolution n by n, and you want to obtain the state of the system or the fields X of T at a, a future time uh, t plus tau um, using. So now we use a PDA solver at resolution n by n, which is denoted by this operator f tau n. This operator f tau n um, simply denotes the composite operator that evolves the fields over an interval tau. So we have made no assumptions about the interval tau at this point. Uh, typically, it's going to be um, uh, the PD solver is going to take multiple variable sized CFL compatible time steps to go from t to t plus tau. So um, yeah, and um, um, that, that will give us the fields at uh, t plus tau. Uh, but if we wanted to save on computational cost, uh, we could also choose to evolve uh, the appropriately coarsened initial condition. So you have this initial condition capital X of T. We could interpolate it onto a lower resolution uh, grid. So you could have a, a coarsened uh, initial condition small x of T, um, which is coarsened by a factor of small m. And you could evolve this course and initial condition using a PD solver at the resolution n prime, which is n over n. Um, and the operator is denoted f prime tau n, n prime uh, to obtain small x at t plus tau. So now you have uh, two different uh, estimates of the state of the uh, of the of the fields at t plus tau. One is uh, obtained using the high resolution solver, which is denoted capital X at t plus tau, and one is obtained using a low resolution solver, uh, which is denoted small x at t plus tau. Uh, the first, um, in the first case, you have a high resolution PD time stepper, which is accurate, but it's also expensive. And in the second case, you have a low resolution PD time stepping scheme, which is imprecise, but it's also cheap. 
the question is, can we uh, recover the high resolution fields by nightly interpolating the low resolution fields? So what if you apply um, some kind of a naive padding or interpolation scheme based on like bicubic interpolation or um, you know nearest neighbor padding um, and obtain a field with the right dimensions uh, denoted capital X tilde T plus tau. Is there any way to uh, interpolate small x at t plus tau so that you recover uh, the fields that you would have obtained uh, if you had used the high resolution PV solver? And the answer is no, um, which seems fairly obvious. Uh, because even if uh, x small x of t is a linear interpolation of capital X, um, small x at t plus tau is not an interpolation of capital X at t plus tau. Um, and the reason is you know you have highly nonlinear interactions across length and time scales, um, which you know the, you're you're losing inter information in the interpolation operator from uh, going from capital X to small x, and also um, the interpolation and time stepping operators do not commute. So. Um, it is not possible in general to recover the output of a high resolution PD simulation uh, by using a low resolution PD simulation over a finite time interval tau. So um, the upshot of it is that uh, capital X of T plus tau, which is the output of your high resolution PD solver is not going to be equal to um, capital X tilde at T plus tau. Um, using which is an upscaled version of a uh, low resolution PD output. But um, um, consider that if T is if, if tau is small, um, small compared to the natural time scales of the system, um, such as the largest eddy um, turnover time, um, then it's a, a reasonable assumption that um, the difference between capital X at T plus tau and capital X tilde at T plus tau uh, will be small, and we can uh, reasonably say that um, it, it could be uh, modeled as an additive um, error um, to capital X at T plus tau, uh, provided tau is small. And uh, we further uh, assume that we can model this error epsilon as a function of capital X tilde at T plus tau. This is uh, purely an assumption and whether uh, it's valid or not will depend on whether um, uh, it works in practice or not. Um, so once we model this error as a function of uh, the inter naively interpolated fields um, X tilde at T plus tau, uh, we can use a supervised neural network uh, to estimate this error, um, which we call um, epsilon um, tau ML at T plus tau uh, as a function of the interpolated fields um, X tilde at T plus tau. Are there any questions at, at this point? All right, um, then I'll proceed. Uh, and so th this is what, uh, the architecture is going to look like now. We have um, we have our neural network here, which is going to uh, take as input the um, interpolated fields uh, capital X tilde at T plus tau, and give us um, the estimated error in these fields. So this estimated error is um, will tell us how. Um, how to correct these fields so that we can uh, obtain a reasonable estimate of what the fields should have been at this time t plus tau had we used the appropriate um, high resolution PD solver uh, with the appropriate resolution. And if you add this correction back to X tilde, you, this is the, um, the machine learning estimate of the fields um, at t plus tau, which we call X ML at t plus tau. So um, this um, is the architecture and it's full glory. So you have, you start with the uh, coarsened fields, uh, small x at t, um, use a PD solver at the uh, coarsened resolution to obtain uh, the state of the system or the fields at uh, t plus tau. Uh, and tau again, as uh, to remind you, is a, a small interval of time compared uh, to the characteristic time scales. Um, you follow this up with uh, upscaling to obtain naively interpolated um, or naively upscaled fields, uh, capital X tilde at T plus tau, and use a neural network um, to obtain the error in these fields uh, at T plus tau, which we denote epsilon ML tau. 
and um, using this correction, we obtain um, the fields capital X ML at T plus tau, uh, which is your ML estimate at this um, time T plus tau. And uh, after this, you can uh, downscale the fields again uh, to the resolution of the PDA solver. And this process can continue um, every tau steps. So this is a, a, this architecture runs in a feedback loop um, giving you um, estimates of the high resolution uh, fields while simultaneously correcting the error uh, due to the uh, due to the fact that your PD solver was not able to resolve the small scale physics. Uh, are there any questions at this point? I have a quick question, JD. Sure, go ahead. Um, is your neural network training on the fly or is it pre-trained? No, no, it is uh, pre-trained. So the way uh, we do that, that's a really good question. So uh, the way we pre-train it is uh, we obtain high resolution snapshots from a simulation. Uh, so that's your training data. And then uh, you would downscale each of these snapshots, uh, time evolve them using a P uh, low resolution PD solver by one time step tau, uh, upscale them and then uh, estimate the error between the upscaled fields and uh, the ground truth and train the neural network on the uh, on 100,000 um, um, fields uh, so that it learns to estimate the error in these fields. And when it comes time for inference, uh, you start with a completely different initial condition um, that the uh, network has never seen before. Um, and then uh, let the network infer what the error is. So how many high resolution you need to do the pre-train? Um, we use uh, approximately uh, 100,000 high resolution images uh, or 100,000 pairs of high resolution images and corresponding uh, upscale low resolution images uh, to do the training. Right, that's probably for specific problem, specific setup. But mm -hmm. when you set up a different, mm -hmm. in a different situation, you need to retrain again. Oh, no. uh, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, our architecture generalizes very well to initial conditions. So um, you don't need to, uh, you, you can start with a completely different initial condition, but we are um, exploring uh, generalizability to, um, uh, to, to different boundary conditions, to uh, different flow configurations, uh, to different uh, Reynolds numbers and uh, I'll come to that point uh, towards the end of the talk and uh, why we think that this architecture um, has the potential to generalize uh, to a wide variety of tasks. Thank you. Thanks. It seemed like two or three slides ago, you said that there, um, basically there's the naive interpolation. Sorry, I uh, can't uh, hear you super well. Um, All right. um, so is this any better? Uh, slightly, yes. Uh, okay, so two or three slides ago, you said that this naive, um, the naive interpolation shouldn't be expected to work. Mm -hmm. um, but then you're proceeding to uh, interpolate by machine learning. And I was sort of wondering what the sort of core difference that the machine learning is adding. Um, is it, I mean, my guess is it's just some nonlinearity, but do, is there, is there something else? Um, right, so essentially what naive interpolation is doing, so uh, think of naive interpolation as just padding, uh, you know, let's say nearest neighbor pixels. That's a simple form of naive interpolation that we've tested and uh, it, it works to, uh, along with the machine learning. So uh, what, what happens in naive interpolation is that you're not actually uh, recovering the model error. You're simply getting a, an image that's of the right dimensions, but you don't actually, you haven't actually corrected the model error uh, that the PD solver introduced by not resolving the smallest scales. Does that make sense? Um, uh, it's kind of like, I mean, if I had to give you an example, if you had a blurry image of, uh, you know, if you had a blurry image, uh, you could try to um, super resolve it by simply padding uh, pixels, but that wouldn't work very well. And that's why we have 
these deep learning based super resolution techniques, which uh, uh, try to sort of generalize how to uh, add new information appropriately in order to uh, get you an output that is actually actually looks like it has uh, more resolution than uh, if you simply um, use interpolation. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, I think I think your analogy was helpful. Thanks. All right, thanks. So we assume that tau is small compared to a characteristic time scale. How small is small? Right. So uh, just uh, to tell you what we the tau we use in our um, example, which I'm going to uh, come to uh, soon, uh, it's about a hundredth of the largest eddy turnover time. So. Is that helpful? Oh, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, uh, so just to sort of reiterate, uh, our architecture is more sophisticated than simply a super resolving a low resolution trajectory. Um, what we're doing is we are nudging the low resolution trajectory towards the correct high resolution trajectory um, by correcting the physics of the low resolution simulation at short intervals of time. So uh, um, in this picture, for example, if you have your high resolution trajectory denoted capital X of T, uh, if you didn't do your ML corrections, then your trajectory would diverge, uh, the, the low resolution trajectory would diverge, um, um, like I uh, indicated over here, but uh, your ML corrections are essentially nudging the trajectory back towards the um, correct trajectory at regular intervals of time. So our neural network is based on the UNET, which is a very popular convolutional uh, encoder decoder style architecture with uh, skip connections. Um, it's a pretty large network, um, depending on how you define large. Uh, it has 14 layers and uh, 167 million trainable parameters. Uh, it was built uh, in PyTorch and uh, trained on uh, multiple GPUs using a distributed data parallel strategy um, using mixed precision uh, via the PyTorch uh, AMP uh, API uh, during network training minimizes the GPU memory utilization and allows us to train bigger uh, models. Um, we further use uh, weights and biases uh, as a dashboard to visualize uh, and track training experiments. So uh, onto the results, we built an initial prototype using uh, the Dallas, which is a Python based uh, computational fluid dynamics solver and tested it on uh, a relay Bernard convection system uh, in the moderate Reynolds number range. So it's, um, the relay number is 10 to the power nine, uh, which is considered strong to moderate turbulence. Um, and the inputs to the uh, network are your low resolution fields at 128 by 128 resolution, which is a four channel field, um, uh, which has the horizontal velocity, uh, vertical velocity, temperature, uh, and pressure fields. Uh, so you have a four channel uh, 128 by 128 field, which is um, upscaled um, using uh, naive interpolation. And the uh, neural network outputs the model error corrections at 512 by 512 resolution, which is the uh, 5, 5 by 512 is the resolution of the ground truth or the high resolution uh, simulation. Um, and you have errors in all four fields um, at 512 by 512 resolutions, which are output by the neural network. And um, as this spec, uh, spectrum shows, after running the simulation for 100 steps, uh, which is roughly two eddy turnover times, uh, we see that our architecture captures the high resolution spectrum pretty well. So um, this is the uh, temperature variables, uh, uh, the spectrum of the temperature variables. And uh, in red, you have the uh, spectrum of the uh, fields generated by the MLPD solver. Um, in blue, you have the uh, naive, uh, naively upscaled result of the low resolution PD solver. Um, and in green, you have the ground truth, which is what the answer should be. And as you can see, um, the MLPD solver um, generates um, a solution which has a spectrum that's really pretty close to the true spectrum. Uh, just to put some of these uh, x-axis numbers into context of so, uh, the wave numbers, um, the low resolution simulation, as I uh, mentioned before, runs at 
a resolution of 128 by 128 and the ground truth uh, or the high resolution simulation is at 512 by 512 so the new information created is created between uh, the wave number 64 and 256 and as you can see um, the uh, mlpd solver can reconstruct uh, the missing scale information pretty well uh, it does uh, have mismatch in the tails but um, as you can see on the y-axis, uh, it's log scale and you have uh, pretty uh, low energies in those small scales where it cannot capture the uh, solution. And we, um, yeah. We can also calculate the RMS error by interpolating the MLPD solution and the ground truth um, onto the coarse grid and compare the RMS error curves um, between the MLPD solution and the baseline low resolution PD solution. So the reason we calculate the RMS error at 128 by 128 resolution is so that we have both the methods on equal footing, the baseline and the uh, ML augmented solution. And what we see is that the error in the baseline grows a lot faster than the error in the uh, machine learning solution. If you look at um, snapshots of the temperature channel of the um, Ray Bernard convection solution with the three different simulators, uh, uh, we have these. Uh, interesting pictures. Um, these are the, the, the top row is, are the snapshots at t equals 175 and the bottom row are the snapshots at t equals 200. Uh, the first column shows you the solution as obtained uh, by the high resolution PD solver, which is the ground truth. Uh, uh, the second column shows you the solution as obtained by the MLPD solver, which is our um, um, novel algorithm that we just presented. And the third column shows you the result of uh, the low resolution PD solver, which is solving the problem at 128 by 128 resolution followed by uh, uh, naive upscaling. Um, if you, I, I've highlighted some of the interesting features um, with these green boxes. And if you um, look at the three different solutions by the three different simulators, you see that the MLPD solution uh, has much greater fidelity to the ground truth than um, the naively upscaled PD solver. Um, and some of these uh, features are uh, pretty easily uh, visually perceptible. Uh, and sh it shows you that the MLPD solver is getting um, a much more high fidelity solution than the baseline. So um, there's some interesting points about um, the architecture. Um, it, it is an all convolutional archi network architecture, which is independent of the input spatial grid size, uh, which allows us to train the network on smaller grid inputs and then apply it on the full grid uh, during inference. Um, we use this, uh, this feature to um, train the network on random 256 by 256 crops of the full uh, input. And um, this strategy opens the door for building constant network size models that generalize well to larger grids. Uh, this would be a promising strategy for ap applications to 3D fields, um, which would require a lot more computational uh, um, resources. Uh, theoretically, we would expect computational efficiency improvements of 64x based on the uh, back of the envelope calculations for a 4x course simulation. And we haven't really undertaken rigorous profiling yet, but we do see something in the right order of magnitude. Um, it's a little difficult to make this apples to apples comparison because the current hybrid architecture uses GPUs uh, to compute the ML corrections while the uh, PD solver is using CPUs, um, a single CPU in fact, uh, at the low, at, for the inference mode. Um, and the GPUs add very little time overhead, but some computational overhead, which is, hard, which is not easy to compare to um, the CPU computational overhead. Um, but we intend to uh, undertake this profiling in, uh, in the future. Um, so we use um, shifter containers to run our code on Cori GPU, which is uh, very convenient since we have to make um, a lot of software work uh, with, with each other. So you have PyTorch and the Dallas, which is the CFE solver and a few other libraries for optimization and data processing. Um, uh, this is a key challenge for uh, making high performance com uh, computing codes uh, work well uh, with machine learning libraries. And any scientific machine learning task uh, has to sort of take into account this uh, fact that you have to um, build a software that works well uh, 
in, in, in conjunction. Then, um, you know, there are um, data loading can be an, an interesting challenge here where, you know, you have a really large file with hundreds of thousands of uh, training examples and to train it, you have to obtain a random batch um, at train time. Uh, we tested some interesting uh, pipelines and architectures, uh, both using uh, an NVIDIA based data loader and uh, chunk HDF5 files um, and fixed the problem and got a significant performance improvements um, due to this. Um, then we use hyperparameter optimization using um, Raytune, which is a library for um, um, HPO. Uh, and this automated hyperparameter optimization uh, gave us some pretty significant performance improvements as well. Now, let me uh, discuss some of the limitations of our work and future opportunities to uh, take this work in some very interesting directions. Um, uh, the most important thing is that three-dimensional turbulence uh, problems, these are considerably more um, of more general interest and they are uh, certainly more dramatically more ch challenging to address uh, in terms of both complexity and uh, required computational resources. Um, there is a lot of scope for further improving the architecture that we have built right now. Uh, we intend to um, uh, introduce physics-based constraints such as, for example, uh, if you have an incompressible flow, then um, you should uh, impose uh, a constraint that says that any output of your neural network should um, have uh, zero divergence. Um, and we expect these uh, constraints will um, help us improve the architecture further. Um, we are um, trying uh, out adversarial training of the neural network. So um, currently we only have an L1 loss on the fields um, to compute the model error. Um, we believe that there is scope for improving these results by using uh, adversarial training of the neural network. And then um, another important point is that this approach is based on modeling um, the fine scale error in the turbulent quasi steady solution. Um, and in, in the present form, it cannot capture transient behavior. So uh, this is something we are uh, working towards addressing as well, um, since that would be a very important uh, feature of uh, uh, ML augmented CFD solver. Uh, we also expect to explore the generalizability of the model across uh, varying Reynolds numbers. Um, uh, domain geometry and boundary conditions in future work. Um, this is this was a interesting question that uh, someone brought up uh, earlier. Uh, and yeah, and um, we believe that there's a uh, this architecture is general enough that um, these uh, factors can be explored uh, pretty conveniently, and um, we hope to make some uh, significant progress towards the generalizability of this approach. In conclusion, uh, this present work demonstrates um, an example of flow simulation, which is computed on a coarse mesh and then enhanced using a deep learning model uh, to populate the finer scales that are normally only available by increasing the resolution and expense of the simulation. Um, the technique also introduces a correction to model errors resulting from the coarse mesh uh, simulation, which is in contrast to uh, post-facto super-resolution approaches, uh, which are applied to artificially coarse simulation data. Um, our technique uh, is a general technique to enhance PD simulation data that is generated by a flow solver at low resolution. Um, we envision uh, many potential applications for this work. Uh, for example, in uh, numerical weather prediction, one may be able to run a low resolution general circulation model and obtain high resolution forecasts using our proposed uh, ML architecture. Uh, large scale DNS of fluid flows for aerodynamics and combustion research might be possible. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do not expect uh, uh, machine learning to fully replace physics-based CFT, um, uh, but we hope that it will augment it and hopefully allow us to expand the horizons of uh, numerical computational fluid dynamics. Um, and ML-assisted DNS models would uh, be a very nice complementary approach to techniques, techniques such as large eddy simulation and uh, Reynolds average neighbor strokes. Uh, I would like to thank um, everyone who worked on this project. Uh, this was a strongly collaborated group effort. Uh, Mustafa is an equal contributor on this work in every uh, respect. Um, Mark, the uh, PI on the science side, has uh, come through with exceptional uh, scientific expertise. Uh, Karthik and Emmanuel have made some uh, very critical contributions at various stages of the work. 
Thorsen uh, at NVIDIA has uh, helped us uh, optimize our codes to get the best uh, performance out of them on um, the GPUs. And we also would like to thank Prabhat, Peter, and Wahid for um, helpful discussions and support throughout. Um, our preprint um, is out on archive, so uh, um, I encourage you to take a look at it and um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, thanks. Thank you so much, Jadeep, okay, for this I have a question. great talk. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Yeah. OK. So when you do the uh, imaging from low resolution to high resolution, mm -hmm. you get an episode. When you do the machine training episode, that episode is still imaging for a particular time, or you need to consider from previous time, this time, every time maybe different that episode. So how would you do this? The epsilon itself is uh, time evolving. Right, right. The epsilon uh, is uh, the way the, let me go back to the, uh, sorry. Um, that's a good question. Let me go back to the relevant slide. Right, so the epsilon is modeled as a function of x tilde, essentially. So it it it, it changes with time. Uh, certainly, it um, depends on the field at the, uh, the upscale field at the current time instant. Um, does that answer your question? And um, because we are using a deep learning architecture, and we uh, the, we are obtaining essentially a function of the fields that um, gives you the error in the fields. Does that make sense? Yeah, right, right. So in that case, you use RNN or something? Um, no, we don't use RNN. Uh, this is a convolutional uh, neural network. So we don't have any time history present in here. Uh, we don't have any time stepping. The time stepping part is taken care of by the PD solver. Um, and that's kind of a, one of the features of our work is that uh, time stepping is a hard problem. And if you wanted to train a, a recurrent neural network to uh, take care of the time stepping, then that in, in imposes a significant computational um, expense, uh, which makes it so that you know it's really hard to scale that sort of setup where you, you um, to uh, extremely large systems. So if you have if you let um, a physics-based PE solver do some of the work, you know. It, if, it, if you let, it, let the physics based solver give you, uh, take you part way to the solution where even though it's an incomplete solution um, and then you use machine learning to correct it, uh, that uh, we feel is a better uh, way to scale uh, these problems. Okay, the following question on this is that uh, this basically in, you are not do this on fly, so you pre-train. Yeah. So probably pre-train those um, well, if if your P, PDE code also in Python, you might mm -hmm. read in those data directly into the Python. If I have C++, mm -hmm. how do I get the pre-trained data into my C++ code? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's what actually we are working on now, where we are um, trying to extend this architecture to um, uh, apply it to um, uh, CFD solvers such as AMREX, which is uh, the adaptive mesh refinement framework that I mentioned. And um, being able to combine deep learning libraries such as PyTorch or TensorFlow with uh, your high performance uh, code in C++ or Fortran is a, a really challenging step for uh, any, uh, uh, any problem. And we are uh, making some inroads uh, on that problem by um, uh, being able to uh, develop some software that can uh, read uh, directly from uh, C++ output and uh, convert it to PyTorch arrays. So we have, uh, there is a software called Sensei in, uh, um, in, in, that, that, that can uh, read uh, AMR output. So we are trying to use that uh, to convert C++ data to uh, uh, NumPy arrays and then perform your machine learning um, operations on NumPy arrays. Okay, so I, I, I have another question. Quick questions. You have 
you use software like a PyTorch and something called DLAS. So what's DLAS doing for you? Oh, Dedalus is a CFD solver. So it's a oh, okay. uh, CFD solver, yeah. Okay, thank you. It's an open source solver. So uh, once we actually, uh, we will be releasing the code for this project uh, shortly uh, once we have um, everything in place. So uh, okay. it, it should be pretty easy to like run the code yourself and um, along with um, PyTorch, yeah. Thank you. Can I ask JD? Thank uh, first. Thanks for the very well well done talk. Uh, I was actually able to follow everything, which is great. Um, the first question from the last um, the, the last person kind of related to my my question, but I want to expand a little bit. The, the fact that you're not doing any tracking over time, you're only you're only sort of learning this deviation based on the current time step and the dynamic state there, mm -hmm. um, that kind of assumes that there's no degeneracy in the solutions, right? Like, is that something you need to worry about where there could be two different high res simulation trajectories, let's say, where the low res simulations would, would diverge to the same point? Is that something that, that can be a problem here? Right, I mean, certainly. I mean, uh, th there is um, an argument to be made that, you know, we would do better if you uh, included the history of the solution, like if you had, uh, if you computed the error based on, let's say, um, uh, the past 10 time steps instead of the pa instead of a single time step, and that would reduce some of this de degeneracy that you mentioned, and uh, it could improve performance. So that's certainly one of the ways we are looking at improving this architecture. Okay. Um, and sorry, if I could just do one one more question. So I think like the main the main thing here is that like you know based in these low resolution snapshots you know that the information the physics about how this may have diverged from the high resolution simulation that's not there right it's only learning this from from the training data it's learning the mapping of like how typically you know a high resolution diverges compared to low resolution so it, it suggests that there is some fundamental limitation on the amount of training data right so i think the like the really important question to ask and i don't know if you sort of showed this a different way or i missed it or something but you know, the amount of data that you really need to train to effectively learn that mapping just from data alone, such that mm -hmm. you, you know, can apply it, can generalize them enough and, and actually not have to run as many simulations. Um, did you really fully show that this in the end to end thing that you can get away with less, uh, less simulation overall? Um, less simulation overall. So like, uh, yeah, the, the idea essentially is that, uh, you would want this to generalize to uh, uh, to, a, to a different yeah it generalizes to a different initial condition right so uh, once you have a trained model you uh, essentially have something that can speed up your simulation the next time you want to run it so like think about it in terms of let's say if if you wanted to train a general circulation model for the Earth's atmosphere let's say uh, you train it over let's say the past ten years of data in order to make uh, uh, be able to like generate high resolution forecasts from low resolution simulations. And then from here on out, you uh, you would like to apply uh, it to, um, you know, you wouldn't have to retrain the model every time. Uh, there is some case to be made that, you know, you, you, you could do better by doing, doing online training. And that's also something we are exploring. So uh, does, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I, I think it does. I, I think it, it, it could be nice if, if, if there was some concrete example where you could sort of show like, you know, we, we had enough training data ahead of time that it was actually able to fully replace. We didn't need the high res simulation for a, you know, a later task. Mm -hmm. um, that, that would solidify the point maybe. Right. So, um, a, I'll hand off the mic then. Uh, to some extent, I think um, this falls in the category of like, uh, of uh, surrogate models such as like large eddy simulation where people do something similar. You know, uh, you have a low resolution simulation, which is, uh, and then you have some ad hoc corrections uh, that, uh, are not neural network based, but you know, based on like let's say, oh, you correct the viscosity or or, or things like that. Uh, so uh, this is um, this builds on sort of that sort of work where, uh, although in, you know, in that work you cannot get an estimate of the high resolution fields, uh, but this is not unprecedented uh, that you would try to estimate the error um, in the subgrid scale uh, dynamics. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, sure. Thanks. Wait, I have a question on uh, on generalizability of mm -hmm. your 2D model. Um, mm -hmm. So what type of obstacles do you anticipate um, if you wanted to come up with a, uh, so taking the same model you built and mm -hmm. trying to apply that to 
say a situation where you have like a, a cone uh, flow at different Reynolds number, what type of obstacles would you anticipate um, if it would not uh, capture the same physics as if you would have used that problem to train your model to begin with? Right, I think a very interesting sort of um, um, general, I mean, uh, approach to generalizing this is if we could um, train it on a smaller domain and generalize it to a larger domain, essentially. So that would make, make mean that you would be able to uh, simulate a much larger um, high Reynolds number system. So that's something that's currently uh, what we are working on. Um, and we, we don't know uh, right now what obstacle, uh, what obstacles we are gonna uh, face. Uh, uh, one of them is certainly going to be the computational cost of training such a model. Um, especially in 3D, uh, like uh, uh, the, the, uh, the cone flow that you mentioned. I mean, that, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly computational cost is one. Um, we might also need to like improve, uh, make improvements in the architecture but to like make it uh, use less memory and uh, make it more generalizable. Um, uh, so yeah, there, there are a lot of opportunities here. Nice, thank you. Thanks. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is Marco Mignon. Um, so if you, if you think about what's going on with your epsilon correction in spectral space, mm -hmm. your small x solution here has uh, slightly incorrect mm -hmm. <clears throat> low frequency components mm -hmm. and has no high frequency components. Right. So basically what you're asking this epsilon to do is to correct your low frequency components and create your high frequency components that are consistent with the solution. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you'd taken a look at the, you know, the Fourier transform of epsilon to see, to sort of break down which of these two components it's doing well. Because, I mean, one thing that you could do if you just want to match the spectrum is like you showed in one of your plots is just fill in the spectrum with something with the right, with the right uh, decay. Mm -hmm. But, but somehow epsilon must be trying to do both of these. And I'm just curious if you have any insight into which it does better. Uh, right. I mean, I think that's an interesting point to explore because uh, I don't think the spectrum itself will tell you everything that you need to know. And as you said, you know, you could uh, generate the right uh, uh, decay characteristics and um, so that just the spectrum of epsilon might not be able to tell you uh, what the answer is over there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there are, um, th there is a lot of like, uh, you, you could potentially uh, try to study that and we haven't done that so far, but that is a very interesting question, I think. Um, and, and yeah, I agree with your analysis more or less. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, just one other quick question. I, it wasn't clear to me the layers in your your neural net are they are they dense or are they localized? Oh no, they're localized. So it's like a it's it's a convolutional architecture. It's uh, based on uh, it's a it's a unit. Um, uh, it's a pretty uh, popular encoder decoder style architecture, but it has skip connections. So um, yeah, we um, don't have dense connections. Because I mean, even though the, if this is a, a local flow, you know, mm -hmm. there's some, there's some finite propagation, the, this correction should be a global operation. Right. right. And uh, yeah, I mean, even though, you know, you have the convolution and local, you still have uh, uh, the uh, receptive field of the uh, network is uh, introducing these, uh, you know, so, sort of global correlations, essentially. So, mm -hmm. um, it's not local as when I when I say local, I don't mean that it's using information only in the like you know local neighborhood. Uh, it, it does extend to a pretty large domain um, uh, based on what the uh, receptive field of the convolutional neural network is. I think, um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. We have a couple of minutes for more questions. Any more questions? Some of the existing literature on single image super resolution uses perceptual loss functions instead of mm -hmm. uh, like a standard uh, RMSE or 
L1 norm loss function. Do you think that those improvements would be useful here? Because it might be tricky to implement uh, uh, a neural network for the loss function as well on a grid. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that is something we have experimented with, but we don't have a conclusive answer to whether, you know, uh, including a perceptual loss or like even adversarial loss improves things. Uh, so we are still working on those aspects. Uh, but it's possible that we could improve things by using uh, more than just an L1 loss. I mean, that's a good point. So I, I have a quick question. Uh, it's about uh, the precision used uh, for um, uh, for the neural network and whether the epsilon um, um, mm -hmm. uh, like requires the same precision. We need to go to higher precision to just to um, um, to track the the requirement by the epsilon. Um, sorry, uh, could you repeat that? Um... Yeah. So, so so basically, you have an epsilon here, and um, I'm not sure what are the precision required to track this um, to predict this epsilon correctly and whether the neural network is able to provide this precision. Right, we, uh, we use floating point precision. Uh, so everything is float 32. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think precision is the issue at this, uh, in this architecture. Like, uh, I don't think using a double would improve the results, you know? Is that, does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah. And the, I have another question also. It's about probably it is echoing earlier question, uh, which is uh, given the feature you used to do the prediction, what could you infer about the physical model um, or the high precision or high resolution physical model? So it's like given that you are able to predict this epsilon, uh, what could you infer about the high resolution uh, simulation? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, as I said, there are, um, in, in the sort of same vein, you have um, larger simulation models where uh, you do something similar, if not the uh, same thing, uh, where you try to infer, um, uh, you know, you try to correct your model by uh, some error correction terms to your, um, uh, in some sense, low resolution simulation. So uh, the answer would lie in uh, that literature, I think. Yeah, so, yeah specifically, I, I would think about like the kind of features you have. You have a feature engineering phase and you found that certain features are enough to do the prediction. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm just thinking about what you could infer about the physical model if you, if you have high or good prediction given the right. set of features that you have selected. Right, I think that's a really good question. And uh, I think the corollary to that is that, you know, uh, what other features you could include to make the prediction better. Exactly. Right. I, I, I think uh, definitely the history of the flow, like, you know, the last 10 steps could is certainly one of the features that I would uh, want to include and try to test on. Uh, I just haven't got to that point yet. Okay, um, thank you again, Jadeep. Uh, virtual applause from everyone, or at least from many. Uh, thanks for, for the talk. Thanks uh, for everyone for the great questions. And um, the video will be posted online and the, um, uh, yeah, the paper is on archive. Thanks again to everyone. Thanks, Jadeep. Thanks a lot, guys.